Hello, Frank Lloyd Wright fans. Welcome to part three of my four part series on renting Frank Lloyd Wright, what it's like to live in organic architecture. I'm Colin Slace. I'm an architect in the Phoenix, Arizona area. And this is a third part in a four part series on the four houses that my wife and I had the privilege of staying a couple of nights in, two nights and three days in. They are houses that you too can rent. Um, one of the houses though that I gave a presentation on the Penfield house, last I heard it was up for sale. I don't know the status of that yet or not. So you might just wanna check on that one. Um, obviously Google it um, and see what the status is on that. But um, today we are going to the Bernard Schwartz house. And this is in Two Rivers, Wisconsin. And again, as in the other parts of the series, I like to not go too much in depth and detail about all the history and the dates and the facts and things to a great extent. I like to just sort of give you some general information about the house, uh, some of its history and information, and then just go right into seeing, um, touring the house essentially outside and in and uh, seeing and experiencing to some degree at least the genius of Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, and then, of course, again, I highly recommend you rent these houses out for yourselves and experience firsthand the greatness of Frank Lloyd Wright. So in this particular case, the Bernard Schwartz house, the client was initially Life Magazine. Um, they had a sort of a dream house um, uh, sort of magazine that was uh, supposed to kind of be about the typical American home. Um, for a family that makes five to six thousand dollars a year in income, and it was they were calling it the dream house at that time, and invited architects to uh, present architectural ideas for um, for that scenario. Um, due to some obstacles and the inability to build it, Bernard and Fern Schwartz, um, with their son Stephen, commissioned Mr. Wright for the home. So it didn't actually end up getting built for the magazine. And so then the Schwartzes kind of uh, took that plan. The, the, the drawings were in the magazine, but the actual construction did not happen for the magazine. It was just to be uh, basically to show the country um, these architects' ideas for a home um, for, a, for a family that makes five to 6,000 a year. Um, again, this is in the 19, late 30s, 1940s. So five to 6,000 a year then was um, apparently enough to build such a home, uh, a little bit different than today. Um, so Wright modified and adapted the dream house design to suit the Schwartz family. Um, so again, the Schwartzes, they liked what they saw in the magazine, the general plan and idea perspectives of the house, uh, but then to fit it to their specific site and their needs, uh, Mr. Wright, of course, um, adjusted the plans accordingly. It is another back to another two story uh, house of approximately 2200 square feet. Um, again, Wright typically designed more one story houses. I personally think he liked them better because he could spread them out on the site um, and kind of even have a closer connection to nature. But um, in this case, we're two story. It was completed in 1940. And again, the main materials, um, Wright always wanted to build thoroughbreds kind of have this minimum of materials, keep it simple, straightforward. Um, so we have brick, concrete, again, Mr. Wright's famous Cherokee red concrete floors, glass and Tidewater Cypress wood. Very common materials for what Wright called his Usonian homes, which were homes um, that he started designing in the 1930s. The first one was the Jacobs house in 1936. And Wright was trying to achieve uh, the need for housing um, at the time, especially after World War II, um, when the GIs were coming back and the GI Bill was, was in place, um, there was a real housing shortage. And of course, the country was booming and growing at the time. So Wright designed these Usonian homes to be what were supposed to be moderate cost, um, but Frank Lloyd Wright's high design um, and trying to provide the best house possible for the average American family. That was the goal um, at the time. I didn't always achieve it in terms of the budgets, but again, 
Uh, we have to forgive Mr. Wright because he was really pushing the envelope, trying to give people better design, organic design at the time for as reasonable a cost as could be. And again, this house was for, available for rent at the Schwartzhouse.com. Um, so as always with Mr. Wright, with clients, with organic architecture, we start with the site. In this particular case, we have more of a um, suburban site and we have the house, of course at the time, the rest of these houses weren't there. But uh, as you can see now, uh, this Schwartz house is surrounded by other houses. Um, but at the time, um, there was uh, much less, um, if not anything here around it. Um, here's the main street, here's the house. You can see already from this flyover that Mr. Wright has angled the house towards the view of the river. And it looks like, you know, typically, other than this house, most houses typically end up being parallel with the street, but not Mr. Wright. And he has angled it for a very specific reason, of course, to capture the view and for privacy. The site, um, again, here's the river along here. And that's the view that Mr. Wright is going to focus on and give to the client. Um, uh, and again, relate to the site and what the site has to offer and um, basically take advantage of uh, the site's finer points. Again, these floor plans I had a great pleasure doing for this presentation. Um, I tried to draw something in the style of Frank Lloyd Wright's office at the time where on presentation drawings, he would typically do pen and ink on kind of this cream colored trace paper. Um, so again, I'm trying to capture the real feel of Frank Lloyd Wright, his presentation drawings, his architecture. Um, so the first floor plan here, here's that carport off the street, which is over here. Again, Mr. Wright typically hides the entries. They're very understated. Um, the, the, the goal here is maximum privacy. So we come up a step here, the concrete floor that you'll see extends to the outside and we have a small entry, a compression of space that will later then open up to the large living recreation uh, area. In this particular case, the dining room is over here. Workspace or a kitchen, again, back in the 1940s, even in the 50s, it's pretty closed off, if not completely in this case. Um, but Wright, of course, has it convenient to uh, the dining area for serving and for guests. Um, we have the mast. Uh, we have, a, again, utility and laundry area um, off the kitchen area here. Um, concrete terrace, those concrete score lines in the floor extend out to the exterior. Uh, master bedroom and master bath are here. The small powder room here, not sure if that was original to the house or not, might have been. Um, and then there's a small built in desk here, double, triple fireplace actually here. This is a small seating area, very cozy, very wonderful. Um, we enjoyed ourselves immensely there, spent a lot of time there. That was the working fireplace at the time. When we were there, I think this fireplace was kind of um, in some repair. In need of repair so we were using this fireplace but then you have this other portion of the living room here in the fireplace and there are um i think these were windows here now but i think at one time these were all double french doors and you could come out to a rear terrace here with a fireplace as well so it was kind of like an outdoor room here um, again typical with frank lloyd wright he always likes to build in planters as part of the architecture to marry the architecture with the site. And we have another planter over here. So it's just another way of, of literally connecting the architecture and the building with the landscape. Up the stairs to the second floor here, uh, you come up the stairs to, the, to bedrooms up here. There's an upper terrace here that faces out towards the street. Uh, again, access by French glass doors. Uh, the gallery here or the hallway looks down to the living area. Uh, there's a little built-in desk here, a uh, little linen closet here and some bedrooms. So from what I remember the story goes, you can kind of see this door here hitting the toilet. 
And there's also a little closet, another linen closet in here. From what I remember the story being is Mrs. Schwartz insisted that this linen closet be inside the bathroom. Now I'm sure Mr. Wright designed and thought, here's your linen closet. It's, it's, it's just, you know, three and a half feet away from the bathroom, completely accessible, but she insisted. And so I think as a little tongue in cheek, Mr. Wright obliged and said, okay, you'll have your closet and <laughs> sort of live with the consequence of that. So Wright would kind of do that from time to time when clients would push for something that he didn't necessarily agree with. He would try to accommodate, but maybe not the way they, they had in mind. Uh, so we'll start the tour on the outside of the house. Here's that driveway again. Mr. Wright always had the cantilevered carport. We're not garaging horse and buggy anymore. We just need an overhead shelter for the car. The front door is behind this brick area here, always hiding the entry. I tell you, it's effective. It keeps solicitors away. Nobody quite understands where to go, or is this a back door, or it's kind of disorienting to the general public. But of course, for us Frank Lloyd Wright fans, we know exactly typically where to enter and, and what it's all about. There's these small windows here in that entry area bringing light and some view in to what we would call the foyer today. But again, keeping it very private from the street. Here's that second floor bedroom with its outdoor terrace, glass doors. Uh, another bedroom here with its outdoor terrace, flat roof, the Tidewater Cypress. I think in this case, it's been painted. Um, and I think the current owner is in the process of continuing to do renovations to the house. Um, because it, was, it was in terrific shape when we were there. Coming a little bit around the other side of the house. Now, here is a typical American home um, today or more recently. And I show this because again, sorry, I'm going around the house, but as we compare 1940 to, I don't know when this was, the 90s or so, you have this huge garage element, um, which, which is most of the quote unquote curb appeal, I guess, of this house. It's huge gables, a bunch of different materials. Um, you've got just this sort of stylized kind of quasi-colonial um, windows here and the roof, all the peaks. Um, it's just got kind of an awkwardness to the scale portions kind of seem odd. You've got this really tall roof. Um, you've got this sort of mannered landscaping here that's very um, uh, controlled. And I just like, I always like contrasting what we've just seen or what we're seeing with Mr. Wright compared to what was being built 50 years later. We'll continue to go around the house. Here's the carport area. We're coming around um, the other side of the house now. Living room, here's that outdoor fireplace to the outdoor terrace. It's that Tidewater Cypress. Again, now we're coming around the uh, sort of the back side of the house. It's a second floor balcony for the bedroom. Here's that living room area. Um, again, the planters I think were uh, in repair. So there was some work being done to those. Uh, here's that outdoor fireplace. Um, and I think the current owner said that in the original plans, there was uh, maybe a Tidewater Cypress kind of fence on top of this brick wall that really did make this an outdoor room. Um, here's some steps up to what I think um, were French doors originally. Continuing to come around the house, here's the master bedroom uh, area with the planter so that landscaping can be seen from indoors. Still coming around, here's this brick wall here, retaining wall, and this outdoor terrace room with the fireplace. Coming around the, uh, the most photographed side of the house in the backyard area. Um, 
another one of those renovation type things. I think this concrete will be colored. Of course, we Frank Lloyd Wright fans know that that Cherokee red concrete floor typically extends directly to the outside. Um, so that's that I think is in process. Here's the, the famous photo that um, is taken mostly of this house. Here's that living recreation room area, these cantilevered flat roofs, the second story, that triple fireplace here, the utility room here, some perforated plywood panels here in the dining area. And we'll take a look at those when we're inside the house. And now we look at that almost that same view from the original uh, photograph from Henry Russell, uh, Henry Russell Hitchcock's book, uh, The Nature of Materials. Uh, where we see the house now and then. Um, so there's that planter, flat roofs, the perforated boards, second story. Um, I think the original owner said that they raised the height of the fireplace because it wasn't drawing really well. So a um, couple of uh, tweaks there, we'll call it. Here's those French glass doors. So you can see that now they're solid pieces of panes of glass, um, but originally they were French doors. So you had direct access um, right out to that outdoor terrace. These French doors are still there. So you can still access the terrace and capture that great view of the, of the river. And here is that view from the terrace. Again, these cantilevered, this cantilevered flat roof open to let some light in uh, but give that sense of shelter again. And back around now to the front of the house. Again, even these site walls, these screen walls are of the house. So the house extends out to the landscape and connects to it. When you enter the house, that little entry door area, and you turn to your right, here's this built-in desk area where you can uh, view mail, pay bills, um, Kind of use it as a little workspace like that. You even have this perforated plywood light screen. Um, the detail and the design of that perforation typically always had something to do with the, the overall design of the house, whether in plan or if there was something about the site, the uh, feature, the leaf of a tree or some feature of the site or of the geometric motif of the project, Mr. Wright would incorporate that into these these plywood panels. From the foyer or entry area, looking into the living recreation area, steps here to the second floor. We have a clear story windows here, high ceiling in the living area. Here's this, that gallery uh, hallway balcony above. Again, Mr. Wright always has low, small, darker entries, squeezing the space, compressing, and then releases you into the large, well-lit living space where the view is. Coming a few steps in and then looking back, here's the main entry door. Here's these, these small windows that allow you some view to the outside and let some light into that entry area. Here's that little powder room, that built-in desk, and that balcony above um, at the second floor. Then you start to come into the main living space these uh, brick piers, the glass floor to ceiling windows with the view out to the lake, um, a light shelf here. What's really great about this is Mr. Wright has down lighting and up lighting. So the, the, the single light bulb lights both down and up, providing indirect lighting, which is a really great way. It, it's wonderful lighting. It's, it's very calming and peaceful. Um, and again, these perforated plywood panels kind of writes sort of later in his career, in his, career the, his more modern rendition of the stained glass windows he used to do in the prairie style back in the early 1900s, 19 teens. Coming a little bit further into the living area, here's this main fireplace here, another fireplace behind this masonry pier here, this masonry mass, the French doors to the outside there, and this, these beautiful red, Cherokee red concrete floors. 
I think the owner told us that this particular house had the oldest working in-floor heating, radiant in-floor heating system in the country. So the, the radiant, the pipes inside the floor here that circulate hot water still worked, provided very comfortable floors. We were there, I think in November again, great time to visit these houses because the leaves are off the trees. And so you get more of a view. And then when you're photographing, you don't have quite as many leaves and foliage in your way. Now, back in 1940, here's the same view of the original house when it was uh, just moved into. So you can see even this, this, the lighting here in the same place. I mean, you know, not much has changed. The furniture, the rugs obviously have, but still in keeping with what, it, what the original design was. Coming over towards the, uh, the windows a little bit more, looking back into the fireplace area. This ceiling here was, gosh, probably about six feet, six inches tall. I'm 6'2", so it was uh, quite cozy, but um, provides a real, uh, again, an interesting effect of just the three dimensionality of the space. Um, just provides dimension to the space, interest, allows the floor, the, the, uh, the doors or windows to go floor to this particular ceiling. Um, and then he's got his clear story windows above here, letting light in from above. Now, why is this in here? Well, here is the typical decor of the day, 1940. So again, you look at 1940 Frank Lloyd Wright, 1940 typical fashion of the day cluttered, more is better, floral designs, uh, you know, kind of just a, a hodgepodge of colors and materials, um, not near the continuity, the cleanliness, the streamlined nature, the thoroughbred of Mr. Wright's design. So you, here you, you can just get this drastic contrast between what was going on at the time and what Mr. Wright was doing. So again, I like putting those in contrast to really see how unique and what, what Mr. Wright doing, what he was doing, and how different that was from kind of the fashion of the day. Continuing in the living area, looking out through the glass, through the windows and the brick piers. Uh, you know, again, what's inside is outside. So the exterior material, same as the interior. The exterior wood cypress, same as the interior. Mr. Wright always had the same materials inside and out for that connectivity to nature. There is no separation from nature. There's no distinction between inside and outside. He wanted the two to flow into each other. This is this cozy, wonderful little nook area back here with the bookshelves, the built-in seating, the fireplace here. Um, we just had a wonderful time here in this area of the house. We had fire, we had our dinners there, our drinks. It was just fantastic. And here is the photograph of that area at night. Just, it's just absolutely thrilling. Um, this feeling of, again, of security, warmth, comfort, coziness, just the humaneness of it, the peacefulness, the serenity. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. The lighting is warm, the warmth of the light and literally from the fire, the firewood is here. We just had such a great time. In that cozy nook area, looking back to the front entry area, dining room is back here, uh, gallery, second floor hallway here. Again, that triple fireplace. Back through the master bedroom here. There's that built-in seating area. So you have the brick piers and the floor to ceiling glass on both sides of this living area. Let flooding it with light. And then we'll make our way into the dining area. And again, here are these perforated plywood panels. Just like in the clear story up here, there's that continuity in design, the brick 
throughout the house inside and out, continues to flow. Following the lines, the grid of the house, the modularity of it, built in shelves, and then the light coming through these perforated boards, lighting the glass wear on it. Then from the dining area, looking into the workspace or the kitchen area, look, Mr. Wright continues that motif, that pattern, these perforated boards, even in the lighting. So you have it at the clear story windows as windows, and you have it creating diffuse lighting in the area. That's kind of a candle effect. Continuity of design, design motif extending throughout the entire house. Uh, from the kitchen area workspace back towards the dining area. Again, a light shelf here with indirect lighting allows the floor to quote unquote ceiling openings. Mr. Wright always did high ceilings in his workspaces to let at that time kitchen odors um, float up to the top of the workspace area. A lot of times he'd have a, a skylight up there, maybe operable. Um, this was also always the, or typically the fireplace utility mass. And Mr. Wright liked expressing that from the outside and the inside, that function of the house. Back towards the front entry area, step down to the master bedroom area. In the master bedroom, here's the uh, master bath here. Again, those perforated lights. This is the closet area, storage. Not the walk-in closets we have today. Mr. Wright wanted you to pare down, only have what you needed, need what you had, keep it simple. And then up the stairs to the second floor. So here, this master bedroom here, we came up the stairs windows here to let view and light into this second floor gallery area. Mr. Wright has floor lighting here now instead of ceiling lighting or wall sconces here. Bedroom at the far end. Each bedroom has access to its own private balcony. Bedrooms were small. Mr. Wright called them basically compartments for sleeping. They were, the purpose of the bedrooms was for sleeping, studying, reading, um, spending your own time there. But Mr. Wright always encouraged the family to spend time together in the larger family areas and or outdoors. Kind of the middle bedroom with those French glass doors out onto an outdoor second floor terrace. And here's the brick inside and out, expressing itself there, the Tidewater Cypress, just like outside. And the third bedroom at the other end of the house, and the built-in bookshelves follow the module of the horizontal board and batten Tidewater Cypress. And again, glass French doors out onto a private balcony. Stepping out to this little this wonderful little homework area um, right here. There's a built-in desk here. You could do homework here, kind of have a little workspace out here in the gallery. Here's these perforated clear story window boards again. And as you walk along that gallery, you can look down onto the living recreation space. Grand piano, Mr. Wright always encouraged his clients to appreciate music. And I think if Mr. Wright could have had a grand piano in every house he did, he would have been just fine with that. He had them in a lot. Here's this light, this light shelf again. And again, these clear story windows letting light in. And those windows here cast shadows and light onto the fireplace and there's the shadow of that pattern again. So again, to summarize, 
Mr. Wright's architecture, as I do in, in all of these presentations. Mr. Wright wanted to express the main purpose of architecture, which is the sense of shelter. Hence the large roof overhangs, um, the scale, the proportions, um, the floor to ceiling windows, creating that, that sense of protection, comfort, and security. Always a love and respect for nature, which is the ultimate context within which all buildings exist. Uh, street names. Yeah, Mr. Wright um, was always fortunate enough to have his projects end up being on street names that were had some sort of nature element to them. So like Frogtown Road, Woodchuck Road, Chestnut Hill, Orchard Brook Drive, Riverview Drive, uh, Meadow Road, Forest Avenue. As from all of my travels around the country, I began to notice that the streets that these houses we were visiting would be on had some kind of nature-based name to them. And I thought, how appropriate is that? for the world's greatest nature loving architect. Um, in talking to uh, Donna Penfield from, from the Penfield house, the uh, wife of the Penfield son, uh, we were talking about what it was about Wright's architecture that was so appealing, that was so successful, that was so, that's so appreciated and loved. And she said, because his architecture returns you to your natural biorhythms. Um, and they do. You spend even just the two nights and the three days in these houses, you won't have a clue unless you, and, and I encourage you to turn the cell phones off, at least for a time, um, you will not know what is going on in the world because you're in your own world of this Franklin Wright House, and it is one of beauty, peace, comfort, and you don't even want to know what's going on in the news when you're there. Um, again, Mr. Wright once said, I never wanted to be separated from the elements. And it is a glorious thing to be in Wright's houses and see and hear and smell the rain, see the snow from within this comfortable, protected environment. To know that it's 10 degrees outside and you've got your fire and you're protected and warm with the radiant heated floors and to be able to experience those elements through the windows, it, it's just, it is, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, Wright's architecture was supremely human. It was a humane architecture. And I say that here because I think when you contrast Wright's organic architecture to the modern contemporary architecture, even of today, it seems like today's architecture is very machine-like um, very minimalist, kind of hard. Um, uh, you kind of almost feel exposed. Um, it it kind of makes it sometimes, especially in public commercial buildings, feels like the scale, feels like the human being is kind of secondary, sort of less significant. Whereas in Wright's architecture was all against that. Wright's architecture was all about the human being, the scale, the feeling, the, the materials, the colors, the textures, um, just a sense of belonging. Um, there's just much more to be in tune with in Wright's architecture. Um, Mr. Wright also once said that he represented an, represented an architecture that was a grace to its site rather than a disgrace. Um, and then the next one, he always felt that a building should look like it belongs where you see it standing that it grew out of the very site from which it came, um, as opposed to bulldozing a site flat, not working with the contours, um, and just kind of sort of sticking an object onto the land and treating the land more as a commodity rather than uh, an environment to work within and to work with. In other words, flow with the stream rather than against it. These are, and it is an alternate universe. When you visit these houses, and especially when you get to stay in them, there, there, there is just this environment of, of possibility, beauty, 
privacy, and as Mr. Wright used to say, peace, space, and comfort. Um, you just feel like, gosh, if this was possible, I mean, it, it really exists. You're living in it in such awe because it's so different than anything else you've probably ever been in. Um, and it, it is to know that this was 50, 60, 70 years ago, that it was done then, um, that it was possible, and that it became a reality is, is just, a, it's very motivating and very inspiring. These are complete works of art, um, and the organic credo is part is to whole as whole is to part. And that's, the, that's where the integrity of the design lies. That these are Mr. Wright's architecture. I mean, you know, if he could, he would have designed the furniture, which he did often. He would have designed the flatware, the dishware, the clothing, everything. Um, why? Because Mr. Wright was creating a holistic work of art. And he was trying to integrate everything about life in the design of the environment. So there's the whole picture and then each of the parts relate to that. So you saw that in the, those perforated plywood panels. They were throughout the house. They were, they were in the, they created features in the artificial lighting, the direct lighting from the outdoors, um, the continuity of of materials inside and out, it's holistic. It's not, well, the architect designs the outer walls and the roof and then goes away and then someone else comes in and just furnishes it however, and there's no thought to a connection between the two. Mr. Wright was trying to integrate everything about your life within that house. It's a part of the landscape and of the environment, a connection. Uh, as we as we showed you, as we looked at in those planters, um, the house literally reaches out into the landscape, um, brings the landscaping into the house, integrates the two, uh, the floor to ceiling windows, the capturing the view, angling the house, no matter what's going on with the street or the neighbors, <clears throat> Mr. Wright's trying to maximize privacy and maximize the advantages of the site being the view and, and, and anchoring the house to the site in that way. Mr. Wright was all about the free, about democracy, of course, and about the free democratic individual unconstrained by styles. Um, no, the, there was no constraint with classical architecture or Georgian or um, some kind of style that you, that you have to follow and adhere to. Wright wanted a free architecture and he thought that that free architecture, which he called and created as organic architecture was appropriate and expressed the democracy of our nation. There are guest books in all of these houses and I encourage you to read the past comments from people that have stayed there because <clears throat> you will get a real sense and understanding of just how wonderful the experience is and how everybody feels the same, how everybody appreciates the beauty, the genius, the tranquility, the peace, the comfort, the art. Uh, it's very spiritual as, as the next one uh, talks about spiritual, the simplicity of it all especially in today's world of complexity uh, and chaos, it seems, these houses are the antithesis of that. And they're, they're just a, a joy to experience. And then lastly, I always end with, for those that haven't seen the previous two presentations of mine, I always like to end with a speech that Ralph Walker gave to Frank Lloyd Wright on Wright's acceptance of the gold medal award where Ralph Walker uh, says to Mr. Wright, you design your buildings as if they were to take their place in a happier world, one of light, of grace, of gaiety, and for human beings who are not burdened with fear, for humans who live in a world where what seems possible is actually so, 
and where the pioneer concept of democracy seems a reality. All your life, you have denied the minimum and have reached for the stars, a free man in a free land. You have asked a drab society to compromise with you on the basis of your ideals. And to that, we end this presentation. Presentation number four, the next one, the Seth Peterson Cottage in Mirror Lake, Wisconsin. And I thank you all for joining me. And until next time, thank you and goodbye.